Hello and welcome to the Will Preach for Food podcast. I'm Doug. I'm pastor of Faith Lutheran Church. We're a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America based out of Shelton, Washington. Thank you so much for making this podcast a part of your day. We're up to, to the fifth commandment in our series on the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. Now, this seems pretty straightforward, but it also begs the question, if killing is wrong, then why is there so much of it in the Bible? Why is there so much violence and warfare in the name of God? And then there's Jesus. What do we do with the fact that he preached nonviolence, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, and it gets him killed? These are big issues, and we can't solve them all in the next 20 minutes or so, but we can make a good start. So first, we'll step back and take a look at violence and war in the Bible and what we can learn from it. Then we will see how Jesus fulfills this commandment and transforms it into a call to radical peace and justice. I'll leave you and your family with some things to think about and some concrete ways to apply God's word to your life this week. For the Faith 5 handout, as well as small catechism resources, please go to our website, www.faithshelton.org. Let's get started. The Fifth Commandment. You shall not murder. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all life's needs. So I grew up singing Sunday school songs about how Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. This is a a well-known story from the book of Joshua, chapter 6. The people of Israel, after 40 years in the wilderness, have entered the promised land. The story says that God tells Joshua and all the people to march around the walled city of Jericho seven times, and God would give them victory over the city. So I grew up singing, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Sing with me, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Well, Here's how the story turns out. Chapter 6, verse 20. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys even the donkeys. You know, I don't remember that part of the song. And it makes me wonder, how can a book full of stories of war, violence, and genocide in the name of God also list as one of its top 10 rules, you shall not kill? Well, let me offer uh, four tools or perspectives for thinking about this big question. First, remember that parts of the Bible are prescriptive and parts of the Bible are descriptive. The Ten Commandments are prescriptive, right? They tell us what we're supposed to do. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, remember the Sabbath. But parts of the Bible are descriptive. They simply tell us what happened. Describe what someone did or said. So the Bible preserves stories and prayers and prophecies that reflected the feelings and hopes of those days. Sometimes these stories serve as positive examples, and sometimes they're negative examples. In other words, just because there are violent stories and prayers in the Bible does not mean that we should be violent. In fact, maybe these prayers and stories are intended to show us why violence and killing, especially in God's name, might be a bad idea. So think about that. Parts are descriptive and parts are prescriptive. Second, these Bible stories in the Old Testament are stories about liberation. Israel had been slaves for 400 years. They were before God set them free. So think about today. Would it be wrong for a group of slaves, after 400 years of oppression, who finally get themselves free, they invade a land full of slave owners, and they attack and burn down a plantation, and they claim it as their own, so that they can raise their own crops and have their own families and their own government? 
Would that be fair? Would it? Third, this is a personal note. I am skeptical about the accounts of the battles in the Old Testament that involve hundreds of thousands of soldiers on both sides, not to mention the accounts of tens and hundreds of thousands of casualties. I find these accounts to be historically and logistically unlikely. What I am convinced of is true is that the Bible tells us (laughs) that over the years, too many armies fight too many wars in which too many people die. And so there is also in the Old Testament a longing for peace, a prophetic vision of shalom, peace, the way things are supposed to be. Centuries of war and fighting and avenging and tit for tat leaves everyone exhausted and short one eye. There has to be another way, a better way. And so a day is coming, the prophets announce, when war and murder and violence will come to an end, when swords will be made into farm implements and people will forget how to go to war altogether. God's going to send a Messiah, the Anointed One, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, one who will be led by the Holy Spirit and usher in the Shalom, the Kingdom of God. When the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Isaiah chapter 11. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, God says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. So that's what Jesus was talking about when he began his ministry, announcing that the kingdom of God has come near. He was echoing the hopes and the prayers of the prophets and the people from centuries before. As he begins his ministry, he begins teaching, and here are some of those familiar snippets from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, You have heard it that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn, them, turn to them the other cheek also. You've heard that it was said, love your ne- neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. This is the vision of the kingdom of Shalom foretold by the prophets. Turn the other cheek, love your enemy, forgive, show mercy, pray for those who persecute you. Do to others what you would have them do unto you. When you do this to one of the least of these, you do it to me. And so the heart, the tragedy of the story of Jesus is that he's the Messiah, the one who proclaimed and ushered in God's kingdom of peace and nonviolence, and he himself is killed by those he came to set free. What do we do with that? Honestly, the significance of Jesus' death on the cross is the stuff of countless volumes of books written by people much smarter than me. But here are our four thoughts regarding Jesus' death for our consideration today. First is simply that Jesus' execution is proof that humanity is stuck in a system of violence. I mean, if we can't keep from killing Jesus, it shows just how messed up we are. The world is a mess because we don't obey the fifth commandment. The world is in rough shape. We all bear responsibility for it. Second, Jesus' death is a demonstration of the love of God for us, including for those who would kill him. No greater love is there than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus goes one further and lays down his life for all, including those who would oppose him. No one takes my life from me, Jesus says in John 10, but I lay it down of my own accord to demonstrate God's love. Third, there is a way to connect Jesus' sacrifice on the cross with Old Testament worship. 
Israel had had an elaborate system of animal sacrifices that were meant to both represent human guilt and God's mercy. And for Christians, Jesus' own death becomes understood as a kind of one and done. His death and resurrection represents for all time the guilt of humanity and the mercy of God. Fourth, Jesus' sacrifice models kingdom living for us today. This is how it is to be in the kingdom of God. Shalom means that we lose our lives, that we turn the other cheek, that we take up our cross, dying for others for the sake of the world. The kingdom of God doesn't reside in some temple or territory, but in the hearts and lives of women and men for whom Christ died and in whom the Spirit lives. And so we embrace a way of peace and justice and mercy and love, the way of Jesus. The Christian life, then, is one in which Jesus has broken us free from the cycle of violence, forgiven our murderous tendencies, and then leads us to a new way of obedience to God's commands. You shall not murder, says the command. Rather, we are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all life's needs. This is how Martin Luther understands it and puts it in our catechism. And and suddenly this commandment impacts nearly every facet of our daily life. Quick question for you. How many of us growing up were encouraged to clean our plates because, quote, children are starving in Africa? Now, it was understood that there was a relationship between what I eat and don't eat and what someone in Africa eats or doesn't eat. That was a fifth commandment charge that our parents made, reminding us that our choices every day matter. And they matter today. Paper or plastic, climate change, carbon footprints, eating lower on the food chain, packaging, chopping down forests in the Amazon, dumping plastic in the ocean. This is all fifth commandment stuff. And what about war today? Is it okay to send soldiers and sailors, tanks and troops, drones and ICBMs to defend our borders, our nation, our way of life, our economic interests? Should we have stricter rules or guidelines for owning guns? Should we lower the speed limit to reduce the number of fatalities? Do I have a moral duty to wear a mask and get a vaccine? These are fifth commandment issues. We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all life's needs. Well, what about abortion? Surely we ought to oppose the killing of unborn children. And just as surely we ought to defend and protect young women who have been raped or are economically vulnerable. We ought to invest in more funding for welfare, for child care, and birth control. We ought to have a strong education system and social network in which these women and their children can grow up safe and secure. We need to keep young men, especially men of color, out of jails and find them good jobs. We ought to acknowledge racism, root, out our, root it out of our national identity, judge people no longer by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, because the fifth commandment. And I haven't even yet taken it as far as Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. Anger, vitriol, conspiracy theories have no place in the kingdom of God, Jesus says. Inciting violence, bad-mouthing teachers, neglecting our children, this violates God's command. Divorce, domestic violence, objectification of women and elder abuse, racial profiling, patriarchy, separating children from their parents at the border to be sold into slavery or sex trafficking... Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. We are to fear and love God, after all, so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors, but instead help and support them in all life's needs. This is the fifth commandment. And so for the love of God and for the sake of the world, let the people of faith look for ways to stop the cycles of violence, war, 
retribution, anger, vitriol, hate, and murder that threaten to undo our entire planet. Here are some takeaways for you. Start with an honest acknowledgement that the choices that we make often have an impact on others. So let's use this season of Lent, these next uh, 40 days, Take, a, take up a topic of justice, world hunger, abortion, immigration, climate change, homelessness. Pick one. Learn about it. Challenge yourself to make one positive change in your, your behavior, in your, in your family's behavior that helps or supports our most vulnerable neighbors. Second, take Jesus' and teaching, uh, Jesus example and teachings to heart. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Turn the other cheek. Take up your cross. Be instruments of God's peace. This is how we fulfill the fifth commandment. Third, think about how you're relating to others. If you're holding a grudge or in an argument with a loved one, you take the first step this week toward reconciliation, toward forgiveness, toward new ways of relating. And finally, and always, pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for an end to war. Pray for God's shalom. When the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. That's what I've got for you this week. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe or like us or sign up for our mailing list at our website, www.faithshelton.org. I want to thank Chaz and Emily for their production work. And I am always grateful, always grateful for the privilege of working among the people of faith. Let's pray for what we talked about today. Oh God, you command us not to kill. May we so fear and love you so that we do not hurt our neighbors in any way but help them in all their physical needs. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.